continuing on with increasing and decreasing functions, we're going to work through another example. This example is finding the intervals of increasing and decreasing for the g of x function, where it's defined as x squared over x minus 2. I have the steps listed in the top right. I encourage you to pause the video and see if you can find the answer to this function on your own. Okay, the very first thing that we need to do is we need to find the domain. And so in this case, we have a denominator. So we need to worry about where our denominator is equivalent to zero at. And that gives us x equals 2. And remember, whenever the denominator gives us 0, that tells us we have a vertical asymptote there. That's going to be important. So when we set up our number line, that also needs to go on our number line because it can affect where the graph changes from increasing to decreasing. Step number two is to find the derivative. I'm going to find the derivative of this one by using my quotient rule which is the original of the bottom times the derivative of the top minus the original of the top times the derivative of the bottom all over the bottom squared. Simplifying this by distributing my 2x through in the numerator gives me 2x squared minus 4x and then minus an x squared and that is all over my denominator and so combining like terms, subtracting my 2x squared minus x squared gives me a single x squared minus 4x. And again, that is all over x minus 2 squared. So there is my derivative. Now in step 3, I need to figure out where my derivative is equal to 0 at. So I just take this guy. and set him equal to zero. Now we learned that whenever we have a fraction equal to zero, we basically can get rid of the denominator by doing the magic trick. So I'm going to multiply both sides by x minus two squared, or if you need to see it, x minus two squared over one, that's fine. On the left, it cancels out, and on the right, we just have a zero left over. So I have x squared minus four x is equal to zero. So basically, when you're working with fractions and you have it equal to zero, then you can just almost ignore what the denominator is going to be, especially since we solved our domain in step number one, because whatever the domain our original function is going to have is going to mimic the domain that our derivative is going to have. Okay, now I need to solve this equation. It's a degree two equation. I'm going to solve it by factoring factor out a common factor of x, and that leaves me with x minus 4. And so when I set this equal to 0, that gives me x equals 0 and x equals 4. So those are my critical values, or my CVs as I abbreviate them. So I have my critical values. I have my restrictions on my domain. Those are the things that I'm going to substitute on my number line, which is step number 4. So my number line consists of my two critical values, which were 0 and 4, 0 and 4, and then I also have my restriction on my domain up here, too. Now, if I leave it just like this, then my 2 value looks like it is a critical value, which is not the case. The 2 is a vertical asymptote. So what I do is I draw it as a vertical asymptote. So that reminds me that 2 is not actually a critical value, and that's going to affect us when we get to the relative extrema part of this section. Okay, so now we need to test our intervals for positives and negatives. Remember, we need to test these in the derivative, and the factored most derivative is the easiest one. So since I'm testing these in the derivative, I'm just going to take my derivative here, and I'm just going to write it in a form that's going to be easiest to test these in. So my derivative is, the numerator, I want to put it in its factored format. It's going to make my test points a little easier to substitute in. And then my denominator, it was in its factored format, so I'm gonna keep it just like that. Okay, 
So my last interval, I need to test something in between negative infinity and zero. So let me just test a negative one. In my second interval, something between zero and two. So I'm just gonna test a positive one. In my third interval, something between two and four. So let me test three. And in my fourth interval, something beyond four. So let me just pick five. And I'm going to test these into this format here. The factored most format of your derivative is going to be easiest thing to test them in. So if I substitute negative one into this here, I first plug it into here, so that gives me a negative value, negative. Then I substitute it into here, negative one minus four gives me negative five, or another negative value. And in the denominator, we actually won't ever have to simplify the denominator because it is something squared. And we know when we square something, it will always end up to be positive. So my denominator in anything that we substitute it in for will always end up to be positive. So this ends up with a positive over positive because negative times negative is positive. And so my final answer then is positive. So that tells me that I'm increasing from negative infinity up to zero. Okay, now I need to do the same thing but with my other three test points. So again, I'm just substituting it into this version of my derivative. First, I have a positive one. Then positive one minus four gives me a negative three. And again, the denominator will always end up to be positive. So that's negative over positive. So that's going to give me a negative. So that tells me it's negative or decreasing here between zero and two. Moving on to my next point of three, gives me a positive three. Three minus four gives me a negative, and actually, I just want the positive, not the actual number there. And the denominator is always positive. So same thing, negative over positive or negative. So that tells me it's negative or decreasing here. And last, five gives me a five or a positive there. 5 minus 4 gives me a positive there, and 5 minus 2, again, doesn't matter what, because I'm squaring it, will give me positive there. So this is positive or increasing beyond 4. Okay. So working through my steps, I have tested my points, my test intervals. So now I basically just have to figure out what my appropriate answer is and check my final answer by confirming it with the graphing calculator. So your sign chart here or your number line is going to tell you everything that you need to know. So when showing work, this is definitely something that you need to show as well as how you get the positives and the negatives to begin with. Okay, so I'm gonna squish my answer up here. I know it's increasing any place I see a positive or my graph is going up. So that is between negative infinity and zero. And then it's also increasing between four and infinity. Decreasing. Now since it's decreasing two intervals in a row, you might ask me, can I just list it between zero and four? And sometimes we can yes, and sometimes we can no. And that's why it was really important to say that this two is a vertical asymptote. If it's ever split by vertical asymptotes, then you must keep your intervals separate. If it's split by a critical value, then that's okay if you combine it in between. Since it's split by a vertical asymptote, I'm going to list these separately. So I have it's decreasing from zero to two, and then two to Okay, so I think I have my right answer, so let me go ahead and check this with the graphing calculator. So I have my original function substituted in x squared over x minus two, remembering to put the denominator in the parentheses so it knows to divide by all of it. I have adjusted my window just a little bit, 
My Y max is a little bit above my standard window, but other than that, it's pretty typical. And so let's go ahead and look at my graph. So we can see it's increasing up to zero, this point right here, and then decreasing. Then I have a vertical asymptote, which is not drawn. But past that, it's decreasing up to my x value of four, and then it's increasing past that. Now let me show you how the calculator can specifically find those exact points of where it switches from increasing to decreasing and vice versa, decreasing to increasing. Let's look at this graph. We can see that it switches from increasing to decreasing. And where it switches is at a high point right here. And so basically we want to find this high point right here and we want to find the maximum. Well, the calculator does that underneath the calculate feature here. So second and then calculate. And then we do option number four, which selects the maximum. Now, the calculator is going to try and lead you through this step-by-step -step process. The first thing it asks you to do is go left bound. So it wants you to go somewhere left of where you think the maximum is. If I think my maximum is somewhere close to here, then I go somewhere left of it by pushing the left arrow key. And when you are confident that you're left of the maximum, hit enter. Now, my calculator gives me this dotted line, but your calculator will just give you this arrow here. That's showing you that this is the leftmost place our maximum can take on. Now, right bound is what it's telling us to do, so we need to go somewhere right of where we think the maximum is by, putting our, by pushing our right arrow. When we're confident that we're right of it, hit enter. Again, my calculator gives me the dotted line, and your calculator will give you this arrow here. So now it wants us to guess where the maximum is. So you go to where you think the maximum is here and hit enter. And it will try and find the maximum between those two arrows or between those two dotted lines. And it tells you that your maximum is at the origin when your x value is 0 and when your y value is 0. Remember when we're selecting intervals, we're just looking for the x value. So this is what's important to us. Okay, the other place on this graph where it switches from decreasing to increasing. That happens at a low point on the graph, and so that's happening at the minimum. So we do the same thing, second, calculate, but we're going to use the feature minimum instead. Now, it wants left bound, but notice I need to go to this other part of my graph. So I'm going to push the right arrow until it jumps over to my right region. And so I'm here. I am confident that I'm left of my minimum. So I hit enter. Right bound, go somewhere to the right of your minimum and hit enter. Guess, go to where you think the minimum value is. And of course, it should be between your two dotted lines because that's where your calculator is going to find this minimum value at. I think I'm pretty close right here, so I'm going to hit enter. And so the calculator thinks that the minimum happens at 4 and 8. Sometimes the calculator does some weird rounding things here, but you can just pretty much leave off the decimal places and note that this switches at their x value of 4, which is what we found in our answer, that we had a high point at 0, so therefore it switches in between increasing and decreasing, and we had a low point at 4, where it switched between decreasing and increasing. Now, the calculator won't be able to pick out vertical asymptotes for you using those features, so that's why it's very important to do the domain as the very first step of the graph, because it can affect where it switches between increasing, decreasing, and vice versa. Okay, so we have officially confirmed our answer, and so this is the end of this section here. And so this is the end.